been a really exciting day. I don't know if all of you are as excited to hear all the um, talks as I was, but there's been an amazing amount of information shared that's been really great. Um, so just to give you a little bit more context, I got into the area of team science and collaboration about maybe 11, 12, 13 years ago. Um, one of my roles was um, when I came to the National Cancer Institute in an administrative capacity was to help bring scientists together across different disciplines and it was really there that I started to learn about collaboration team science but also became very interested in trying to understand what contributed to successful team functioning. What are those elements that brought teams together, kept them together and what were the things that, um, that didn't, that got in the way. Um, so what I'm going to do is give you a little bit of um, I, sort of an introduction to what I've learned over time, a little bit of introduction to something we call the field guide as a document that um, I've developed with some colleagues and I will show you that at the end, but a lot of my content comes from that. I also thought it might be helpful to share with you uh, my perspective from um, having been very involved in helping planning in the context of teams. Um, what I would describe as consulting for teams and organizations that are interesting, interested in shifting their cultures to a more collaborative culture, um, working with teams where trust has dissolved, where they've gone off the rails and they've wanted to get things back on track. So maybe a little bit differently than some of the people that you've heard about from today, I really consider myself a practitioner in team science. Um, kind of roll up my sleeves, um, work with teams to really try to understand what contributes, like I said, to successful team functioning. And those are some of the things that I'm going to try to talk through today. Um, so um, why don't we just launch in. I'm not giving you a lot of background because you already have had brilliant background from the previous speakers. And so we'll just sort of dive in. So I thought one of the things that you might find interesting or I thought I could bring to you is the, that you know, in, in the work that I've done, I've had the opportunity to be a quote unquote team science expert, which is never where I thought I would be in my career trajectory. Um, but it's been really interesting and it's been really fun, both from an individual perspective, the team perspective, and the organizational perspective to really think about what contributes to teams functioning the best within the context of their organizations. And so I thought it might be helpful for you to hear from me. If I'm at an organization and I'm trying to understand how well they're doing in the arena of team science, how is their culture? Are they very focused in team science? Are they, are they talking the talk? Are they just talking or are they really walking the walk? And if I'm looking at a, a, a proposal and a grant proposal, for example, what are the types of things that I look for in that proposal that conveys to me that the team is really focused on team science and collaboration, that they've really thought about this. They're not just talking about it. They're not just using the words because they think it'll be perfect for the reviewers. And so I want to help you understand that if I'm sitting on one of these review panels, I know if you're authentic or not. And that might be hard to believe, but it's true. <laughs> um, so just some of the elements that if you look at this slide, like what am I looking for if I'm on a review panel? Um, or what I'm, what's being asked of me. So how is the team going about identifying the team members? How, how are they building, forming, and sustaining the team? How are they planning to lead the team? Um, what type of research is being done? How are they gonna engage the community? Are they really gonna engage the community? Or are they just gonna go out and talk to a few people? Um, what about communicating? Everything from the logistics to the actual process of communicating as well as managing the team. So writing a research proposal with a team science component is not a whole lot different than writing a research proposal without one in that you have to have some really compelling science, right? You've got to have a challenge, a scientific challenge, and we've talked a lot about that today, this morning. Um, we heard some really neat examples of things that people are doing and how they get their, their heads around some of these complex problems. So adding the team science component piece, the team, you might call it a management piece or a collaborative piece, how is it that you're going to convey to the reviewers that um, 
the work that you've actually put into forming the team, how the team's going to work together, what's the advantage that these different perspectives that you've brought together, what are they going to bring to the research project? Um, we talked, I mentioned communication already. How are disagreements going to be handled? You are going to disagree. I can guarantee it. It's not that disagreement's bad. You just want to have a plan for how to, how to manage it. How are things going to be shared? Um, if you're on a team and somebody decides they don't want to share their data with you until they're ready to present it to you two days before something else is due, that could be really problematic. And what's your philosophy for training and mentoring in an era of team science? Um, I put a little note at the bottom that all of these things together can come together to form um, what you might call a collaboration plan or a collaboration agreement. So there are things that are going to benefit you, they're going to benefit the team, and they're going to benefit um, people beyond that as well. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to kind of took those additional uh, initial things that I showed you and I'm going to sort of broke them down into a little bit more specifics. So thinking about team member identification, so what are the scientific backgrounds and expertise? What are the interests, the motivations, and how does that fit in the context of the, the project as a whole? When I, was, um, when I worked with my collaborators to try to understand what were the elements that contributed to successful team functioning, we interviewed five different teams. Um, in their entirety. So not just the leaders, but every participant on the team. And we studied three teams that we would describe as very successful. So for, in my context, it was from basic science all the way to the clinical setting through FDA approval. Two, one team that failed, they had a, just sort of a miserable failure, it just didn't work, and they kind of had to disband. And one that was in the process of being formed. And using all of this information and all the data that we collected from the interviews, we were really able to identify what we consider some pivotal elements. I'm going to talk about a few of those, and I think among the most important fall under the team building and management. So I'm going to talk about trust setting expectations and a little bit about team development. Um, and then under effective leadership, I'm going to actually talk a little bit about leadership and also about shared vision. Um, the, Collaboration plan falls under sort of an area of setting expectations, so we'll talk about that as well. So just to hit this, the, the, some of the things on the right side, you know, thinking about the disciplinary backgrounds, I talked about authenticity already and communication skills, and so I'll, I think I'll jump to the next slide. So what I thought it might be fun to do is to put together a couple of scenarios for you. So you're now reviewing a grant, you're looking at the, the, the things that the proposal, proposer is putting forward. And this is how the, there are three different scenarios on the next slide of how the, um, the, the person making the proposal is describing the team, okay? How they're gonna form the team. The first one says, once I'm funded, I will form the team. I will be the leader, I will outline the goals and objectives, and will give the team explicit directions in order to successfully achieve the goals and objectives of this project. Okay, so a little bit of giggling, yeah. Um, have I really seen stuff like this? Oh yeah. B, the team is well established. We've been working together for years and are very comfortable together. Okay, so, so, a few nods. Um, C, I have reached beyond my comfort zone and identified individuals who are also interested in this complex problem. They represent a variety of disciplines ranging from close to the science to expertise in the technological methods to community level responsibilities. Okay, and so this just gives you a little bit of a sense of the breadth of things that, um, that I have seen, just as a, an example and you might be able to make a pretty good guess as to which one I was most intrigued by. A, no. <laughs> so the, the point of this next slide is just to really to convey to you that you know, team science is all about bringing people together, right? It's all, bringing them all together around a project. So that's what really sits in the center, the project, um, the complex science. And what I want to try to convince you of in the next uh, few minutes that I'm speaking is that if you are not also tending to the vision, trust, 
the institution, communication, power dynamics, sharing credit and resources, and setting expectations, that these are some of the things that are, that are gonna cause the team to derail. These are some of the things where instead of focusing on your science, you're gonna be ending up helping people focus on their personnel issues, on correcting something that didn't happen, um, ne yes, negotiating or arbitrating uh, difficulties in whether somebody should be sharing a reagent or their data. And that's not really where you wanna be spending your time. So the first element that I'm gonna talk about is something that um, I think is, is probably very comfortable for most people, and that is developing the shared vision. I mean, if you think about this part, this is very compatible with the research proposal. So what is the vision of your research, right? So if you're um, on an elevator and you are going up, you know, we talked about this earlier, and you're going up, what's your elevator ride speech? What are you going to tell that person with a million dollars in their pocket that you're going to do, that you can do? You only have 30 seconds, but what is that? What type of impact are you gonna have? So that's one, one reason to be able to say your vision clearly and succinctly is that it captivates the person you're talking to. You wanna have some sort of a hook. The other reason your vision needs to be compelling is that that's the reason people will join you. That's the reason people are gonna follow you. It's your vision. If you have something that they can't imagine not being a part of, they're gonna wanna be with you. And so you have to figure out how to go there and sometimes you have to worry about um, figuring out how to, how to get there together. So one of the things that we learned when we were interviewing these different teams, the ones that were very successful and the ones that weren't, is that, and I think I found this to be very intriguing. So in those teams that were very successful, everybody could describe the grand vision of the project. It didn't matter who we talked to. We could talk to the administrator, we could talk to the summer student, we could talk to the animal handler, as well as the PIs, and they would be able to articulate the vision for the project. The other thing they were able to do is articulate their vision for their component part of the project. So not only did they understand the big picture, but they understood what they were doing in the context of the big picture. Now the more senior we got, the more the, the senior folks had a sense of all the different components, and the more junior we went, you know, they knew their stuff and not as clear on the, the things that are happening beyond them. But I think you get the idea that people really have spent a lot of time talking about this vision, revisiting the vision, um, correcting it, adjusting it as you go. Sort of like you have to adjust the trajectory of the airplane from DC to San Francisco. If you're a degree off, um, you might not make it there, so you, right? So you have to kind of keep adjusting as you go. The other thing that we learned through doing this research is that building trust, developing trust, is really, really critical. And, you know, I think when I used to say this in groups, maybe seven or eight years ago, people would kind of roll their eyes at me. We, we knew that trust was really important. Um, I think sometimes people say, you know, this is pretty fluffy stuff, Michelle. It's kind of hard to get your hands around. Um, but as, after we published the field guide and after I was being asked to work with teams or institutions to work with their folks, what you really, what I really saw is that when things weren't working, it's because that, uh, that foundation of trust either had started to crumble or wasn't fully formed. And so it really had a lot of impact. So I'm going to actually talk to you about trust a little bit. I think the other thing that surprised me a little bit about trust, um, again, oncologist by training, basic biology, um, you could spend your whole career studying trust. The, there's a phenomenal amount of literature. And so it's actually kind of an interesting place to spend some time and, and learn about. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you about three different types of trust that I've learned about that I think have been really helpful to share in the scientific setting. So one's called calculus-based trust. So calculus-based trust is built on the calculations of the relative reward for trusting or losses for not trusting. So what does this mean? This means when you're driving in the street, you have to trust the other people who are driving, right? Just like they have to trust you. Um, another example of this is for, so my background, as I said, so lab scientist. Um, so one example is standard operating procedures in the lab. 
One of our standard operating procedures was a very simple one, but when people violated it, people got really, really upset. So here's the scenario. I go, I mix up a solution of um, using the sodium chloride, I use the last of the reagent, I put the top back on the bottle, and now what am I supposed to do with it? So. Replace it, right, right? And then there was always that person in the lab who just put it back on the shelf, right? And so you give, they do it the first time, you give them a pass, you explain the rule, right? But the next time if they do it again, your trust in them starts to, starts to, I guess, dissolve, right? And if they keep doing it and they keep doing it, that can create a real tension in the, in the lab. So if you think about, the, think about the context and think about the value of just standard operating procedures in the context of your team, in the context of your operations, it's a nice scaffold for developing trust, and I'll, I'll come back to this in a moment. The other type of trust is called competence-based trust. And competence-based trust, my best example is, again, another lab example, where there was a guy who worked down the hall from me who I described as having golden hands. If I couldn't get an assay to work, if I couldn't get a procedure to work, I'd go down and I'd ask him if he would help me. I didn't know him very well, but I knew he was super, super competent, and he was super, super generous with his time. And so he'd usually, you know, in a couple of hours, have me on my way, and it would be working. So that's competence-based trust. You don't really need to know somebody, but that competence is there, and you trust that. The last type of trust is called identity-based trust. And this is the type of trust that we tend to preserve for um, those that we care most deeply about. Our partners, our um, loved ones, our family members, our best friends. Sometimes this can be established in the work setting, but not always. So just giving you these, the, this, um, these three different types of trust gives you a little bit of a sense of the different ways in which trust can be established in, in the work setting, in the research setting. The other thing that I learned about trust was that people generally fall into two camps. They fall into high trust camp or a low trust camp. And so this is a scenario. You and I just met. We start chatting. We start thinking, oh, we actually, maybe we could start working together and start a collaboration. Do you start with me high trust, like you're going to trust me right out of the box, or are you going to start low trust, and I'm going to have to prove myself to you? So who in this room would start high trust? Low trust. Come on, low trust. You know, it's about 50-50. In the population, it's about 50-50. And, and it's, this graph just tries to depict that. If I'm starting high trust with you, I'm looking for you to sustain that trust, right? But if I'm starting low trust, I'm looking for you to, let, to build that trust with me. And so again, if you're, this is just again, you know, we've heard a lot about the value of reflection today. So if you were to think for a few minutes, if I'm starting a collaboration with somebody, very rarely do I walk up to somebody and say, hi, I'm Michelle, I'm high trust, right? You know? <laughs> um, so you're gonna have to kind of figure it out. But if you're low trust and I'm starting out high trust, what does that mean for what we're doing together? And so again, it's something kind of good to think about, especially as you start bringing your team together. Kind of gives you a sense of how you can start working together most effectively. Setting expectations is another characteristic of the things that really strong leaders do well. So what about roles? What about responsibilities? Who's going to do what? How are you going to do it? When are we going to meet? Um, all of those little details. And so setting expectations is a great example of um, the kind of establishing that calculus-based trust. It's a great example of saying, these are our rules. This is how we're going to work together. It gives everybody a starting point, and it gives everybody a foundation for a similar starting point. So I'm just going to share with you three examples of types of tools that you can use for setting expectations. All three of these, we have templates in the back of the field guide, and I will show you a picture of the field guide at the end, which you can access online as a PDF. It's freely available. Oh, and I think it's referenced in the, um, in the book, too. So one of them is a collaborative agreement. Kara referred to this as a prenuptial agreement earlier. The reason that my collaborator, Howard Gadlin, used to call it a prenuptial agreement was that he always said there were no two people more foolish than people falling in love than two people starting a collaboration. 
And so really the collaborative agreement is um, we provide a number of questions that people can use to answer that once answered can really provide the foundation for a collaborative agreement. The welcome letter is another tool um, and the, we, there's this guy at the NIH, his name is Rich Mariah, he works in the Child Health Institute. And before anybody can start in his lab, he hands them an eight page letter. In that letter, yes, eight pages. Um, he, in that letter, he outlines what he expects of the student or the trainee, what they can expect of him, and how he expects that they'll be working together. So I don't think a page really has to be um, eight pages in, in length. But what that letter really does is it sets very clear expectations. And we actually took that letter and have taken it in a number of situations when we've been working with people and teams. And we've suggested to them that either as a team or the leader of the team, write a collaborative or uh, write a welcome letter to help really set the expectations for the team. And it has really helped people a lot. So it's another way of just kind of laying things out. The last one is institutional agreements. And so one way to think about an institutional agreement is that challenge that we've been talking about in terms of recognition and reward. Right, so if you're bringing somebody onto the team and you know that they're gonna be going up for tenure eventually, is it possible to establish an agreement with the institution where you, you state outright that this individual has been recruited to participate in team science? And so part of the recognition and review process should include looking at that as a component of what they do. So again, three different ways of, of thinking about expectation, or yeah, setting expectation. So the next slide should be coming up, and there we go. Don't go away. Okay, so this is the model of team development, and I thought this would be helpful to share with you, be, whoops, I knew it was gonna do that. Um, I thought this would be helpful to, to share with you because Teams go through predictable phases as they are brought together and as they are moving towards becoming what I would call a well-functioning machine. Um, the cool thing about these different stages that were introduced by Bruce Tuckman in the 1960s is that they rhyme. Um, so you'll remember them later today. Um, so there's forming, storming, norming, performing. And Bruce Tuckman came at these in part by studying research teams, but he also studied other teams as well. So the forming stage is just like it sounds, the team comes together. The storming phase is a lot like it sounds. This is where the, um, the differences of the team among the different team members become very obvious to people and people start feeling a little threatened, they feel a little uncomfortable, they might feel like this is my turf, not your turf, don't get too close, no I'm not gonna share my data. I'm in a bad mood, leave me alone. So it's really the team has not figured out quite how to work together. Um, we've heard a couple of things today. So one of the things that we've heard about is you know, the extent of diversity in the context of a team. With more diversity, there's gonna be more storming, regardless of the type of diversity, because you're, you know, people can, will just be, have more differences, be at odds about different aspects of whether it's the work or personality styles or dimensions of their background. And what we tend to do is, especially when we just meet people, we tend not to encourage disagreement or conflict. We tend to try to smooth things over, to create harmony, right? And so what ends up happening is we end up not having those difficult conversations that we really need to have if we want to get through the storming period. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. So in order to get to the norming stage, you have to go through storming. You can't skip storming. So if you just try to smooth everything over in the storming phase, it's gonna come back and haunt you. So again, you get through the storming phase and get into norming, and norming's where everything starts to gel. It's, you know, it's when the trust really starts to form, when the norms of the group are established, where everybody is feeling more comfortable together, roles and responsibilities are clarified, you're, you're doing better. And then that can get you into the performing stage, and that's sort of like the well-oiled machine. So I've already mentioned that storming is not optional. 
Um, the other thing about this cycle is that if you bring in new team members or you have some people leave the team, it's going to go through another cycle of storming. Might not be as dramatic as the initial, but it'll go through again. Um, and I, I think maybe it's nice to just, maybe I can point out briefly, is that I've worked with teams before that are kind of stuck in the storming phase. It's hard to get through the storming phase if you don't really understand what's happening. And so after introducing this model to them, I've had in a couple of groups, somebody will go, oh, we're storming. And people go, oh yeah, we're storming. And all of a sudden, it's okay. And it's okay to have those more difficult conversations. So just like having a vocabulary word for it somehow gives you permission to experience it. So now you have a new vocabulary word. So the other dimension of collaboration that became really clear through the conversations we've had with people is that collaboration also introduced threats. So really what we're asking people to do is to move from a self-identity to a group identity. We're asking them to move from independence to interdependence. And so whereas they're used to having single status, they're used to having power, uh, making their own decisions, they're used to having autonomy, now they have to share these things. They have to interact with somebody else. There's shared power. We're gonna be making decisions together. We're gonna to be deciding how resources are put towards the project together. And this can be really challenging for some people, not everybody, but especially maybe your world is different than mine, but in my world, we've got a lot of scientists who have pretty big egos. And so it can be really hard to move out of that realm where you've been trained as an individual and your whole life has been focused on having individual accomplishment and now trying to move to something that's, that's broader. So this is just a quote that kind of gets to that. So the greater the proportion of experts a team had, the more likely it was to disintegrate into nonproductive conflict or stalemate. And it just kind of gets into the thing. If you bring a whole bunch of experts together who are really, really smart, you've obviously brought them together for a reason. And so it, if people kind of get stuck in their expertise, that makes it challenging. So we heard some really great and very eloquent articulations this morning about growth mindset, right? So this is where growth mindset becomes really, really important. And I'm gonna actually touch on that um, in a few minutes as well. So what about diversity? We heard a lot about diversity already. I'm just gonna touch on a few things because I think it's valuable to think about. Um, so team science is an exercise in diversity. You have different perspectives, varied experiences, range of expertise. You're gonna ask people to challenge methodologies and approaches. You're gonna ask them to question interpretations and results. So we think about, think about um, what you really want to achieve is an environment where you can have productive collision. So what does this mean? It means that, well, look at that. Mac to PC kind of messed up the words, but you get the idea. You know, you really want to contain the effective and personal conflict, right? So that's really not where you want to go. You do want to have disagreement, though, or be able to talk very openly about the, the science and the ideas. If you don't think it's a good idea or if it's, the result, you're not so sure about that interpretation, you need to be able to have those conversations because those are the conversations that move the science forward. Those are the conversations that move the ideas forward. You can't have them. But if people start getting personal, that's where things will start to devolve. So we've heard a little bit about this already today, so I'm not going to spend a long time on it. Um, there's a nice study done by Hong and Page a number of years ago where they really were able to show that a diverse group of people is much more effective at solving problems than a homogeneous group. And they basically did a random selection of intelligent participants from a diverse group, and they also took the best performers, and they had them, and they compared them. And basically the bottom line was is that the people chosen randomly outperformed the, the people who were cho chosen as experts. Um, so the bottom line, if you want to think about it this way, is a team of experts does not necessarily equal an expert team. A lot of people have heard about this in the context of the money ball examples as well, right? It's the same type of idea. The other thing that we've heard about a little bit is that more women smarter teams. 
So this is a quote from a paper by um, Woolley and Malone. So there's little correlation between a group's collective intelligence and the IQs of its individual members, but if a group includes more women, its collective intelligence rises. And so we heard a little bit earlier about impact factors and including um, women as well. I just thought I'd throw this up because I thought this was fascinating. If you were watching the news over the um, weekend, you saw that California was the first state to mandate female board directors. So I thought this was kind of interesting in the context of this, and so I think they've jumped on board and think that diver diversity is important. Um, of course, this is highly controversial, so just check your Twitter feeds and you'll see how the controversy behind this. But I thought it'd be good to mention. And we've also, we've also heard that mixed gender scientific teams produce more um, higher impact research, and so I won't go into this in detail. Um, what I thought I would do, though, is I want to show you a video that I think will reinforce um, very nicely some of the stuff that you've already heard today um, around inclusion and diversity. And am I going to Chrome? Yes. Thank you. Oh, Desi. This is using the video tracking software. All right. Explain. My coworker Wanda and I are sitting in front of an HP Media Smart computer. Uh, state of the art computer, wouldn't you say? I'd say. We're using the fa the face tracking software, so it's supposed to follow me as I move. I'm black. I think my blackness is interfering with the computer's ability to to follow me. As you can see, I do this. No following. Not really not really following me. I back up, I get really, really close to try to let the camera recognize me, not happening. Now, my white coworker, Wanda, is about to slide in the frame. You will immediately see what I'm talking about. Wanda, if you would, please. Sure. Now, as you can see, the camera is panning to show Wanda's face. It's following her around. But as soon as my blackness enters the frame, which I, I, will, I will sneak into the frame. I'm sneaking in, I'm sneaking in. I'm in there. That's it. It's and over. there we go. It, it stopped. <laughs> my hands are here. Wanda, please get back in the frame. Get back in. As, 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 soon, as soon as uh, white Wanda appears, <laughs> the camera moves. Black Desi gets in there. Oh, nope. No face recognition anymore, buddy. I'm going on record, and I'm saying it. <laughs> Hewlett Packard computers are racist. I said it. So, um, it may be obvious why I wanted to show this to you. Um, but I think I, We've talked a lot about the importance of diversity and inclusion. We've talked about the importance of different perspectives. And I think one of the things that we've also talked about today is who's on my team? Do I have the right people on my team? So one of the things that I would always challenge you to do is take some time to reflect and step back and say, are we missing anybody? Is there a perspective that we don't have on the team that really needs to be included? Um, it won't surprise you if I tell you that this video went viral, that there was this very um, complex reaction from Hewlett Packard. Um, it was very um, full of excuses, I think, is the best way to, to describe it. If you wanna go unpack this, there's a lot of stuff on the web and there's interesting videos. The bottom line is, is they ultimately did fix the problem, um, so that was, that was good. Um, let's see. So let's talk about um, communication a little bit. So I'm watching my time. Um, so I think what we're going to do, so I'm going to talk a little bit about communicating effectively. I'm not going to, I think one of the elements that we, you've heard about is the importance of how, to, how do I communicate across different languages. If we bring different disciplines together, we're not going to understand each other a priori. And we really might have to do some, I think we heard some, you know, Diff new discipline 101 type of training so that we better understand each other, which um, can be very effective. So 
we talked a lot about the growth mindset, and so I'm going to build on that a little bit. So I was recently exposed to the work of Roger Schwartz and Associates, where I was, I think what intrigued me most about his work is that it goes beyond suggesting that we need to learn new skills or employ new behaviors. And I think some of the things that I talk about kind of are in that vein. Well, if we behave like this or if we do this or remember to build trust, what he really says is that we, we can do those things much more effortlessly and efficiently if we really shift our mindsets, if we really make this an authentic component of who we are. So he talks about needing to have values of being transparent and being curious, um, informed choice, accountability, and compassion. And then making the following types of assumptions that are, again, what he describes as mutual learning that I have information and so do other people. Each of us sees things others don't. People may disagree with me and have pure motives. Actually, ever since I've learned about this work, that's the one I keep saying when I'm in meetings and the person across from me is saying something that I just cannot believe they're saying. And I pull myself back and I say, remember, they have very pure motives. They care about this as much as you do. So really to kind of make sure that we're doing the listening we need to do. Differences are opportunities for learning and I may be contributing to the problem. So that's another one is it's very easy for me to think, well, I'm right, I know what's going on, but sometimes maybe the way I'm behaving could be having impact as well. So if you're interested in this, he's written a couple of books, um, one, one um, focused on smarter teams. So I have a riddle for you, not really, but so what do gift giving and team science have in common? So I don't know that there's an easy answer to this, but it, I wanted to try to tee this up with a bunch of boxes and ribbons because, and I think we've really talked about this as part today, is that part of the success in the work that you do in teams is this opportunity or ability to brainstorm. And so this goes back to the growth mindset as well and the ability to really work with each other. If we can think about ideas as gifts, each other's ideas as gifts, just think about when somebody gives you an idea, they're giving you a present, a big, beautiful blue box with a nice green ribbon, all right? And so that's a present for you. So what can you do with that gift? What can you do with that idea? Well, to, I'll give you some examples of things we tend to do with those presents that we get. Sometimes we say, oh, that's a bad idea, right? We do, don't we? Sometimes we say, oh, how are you going to do that? Sometimes we say, sure, that's interesting, but, and the but's just a way to pick your foot up and stamp on the box and turn it into little bits, right? Um, I have a better idea. It'll never work. The group won't like it, right? And if you think you can replace but with however, just remember that however is a fancy but. Okay? How do you want to respond when somebody gives you, what do you say when somebody gives you a present? Again, what? Yeah, so thank you. And let me build on that idea, right? So take that idea, consider it a present, and even if you don't agree completely, add to it. So I actually did this very purposefully about a week ago where I had a group of people in my office around the table and I really, I probably, I came into the meeting with a bad attitude. I thought I knew what the answer should be. And the first person spoke up and I was about to say, oh, really? <laughs> and I caught myself. I said, just, just be quiet. I said, oh, thank you very much. Does anybody else have ideas? And the other ideas started coming out from the other people around the table. And we ended up at a place that was so much better than I came into the room with. So that's just my own little vignette. So thank you, and is the foundation for creativity and innovation. It requires trust. It can help you bridge, like for me, my not really very good idea to a much better idea through the piling on of ideas. And it can help sustain, maintain, and strengthen teams. So if you really want to give your team a challenge, for one day, tell them that they can't use the word but and see what happens. So I promised you a couple of words on leadership. I, um, when we did this work 
and we started to learn what was contributing to successful team functioning. I think I was really hopeful that we would find that there was a, a formula for leadership. You know, X plus Y equals something something, and, but there really wasn't. However, there were characteristics of the leaders that were pretty consistent among those teams that were successful. So the leaders were um, self-aware. They had a lot of self-awareness. They understood themselves pretty well. And so that goes to the value of those assessments that you get to do every once in a while, like the MBTI or the DISC. But people, really ha people who really take that on and, and understand themselves, um, they had really strong teams. I think what that does also is and it establishes an ability for you to become more aware of the things that are happening around you, so self-awareness and then other awareness. They had a shared success, uh, responsibility for success. They were accountable for issues and problems. They were great mentors. They knew how to manage up and across. We heard a little bit about safe environments to, to speak in, but creating a safe environment where other people feel comfortable speaking up is critical. So just think back, if you're working with somebody and every time you open your mouth, they step on your box, you're not gonna feel very safe and you're not gonna wanna keep giving presents, right? So you wanna create an environment where people are happy to keep giving each other presents all the time. Um, they can have difficult conversations, they can speak up, they challenge ideas, they give their best every day. And I think one of the things that I really appreciated in meeting a lot of these leaders is that, is that I think sometimes when people step into leadership positions, they do not realize how closely people are watching them. That they are really watching them to see what they're doing. So what I'm trying to say is it doesn't matter what you say, it matters what you do. Because people are gonna model your behavior if you say one thing and do something else, they're going to watch what you do and model that. This is another quote. So the most productive, innovative teams were led by people who were both task and relationship oriented. What's more, these leaders changed their style during the project. So what does this mean? It means that the leaders are very task oriented. So that's great to be a project leader and to be focused on the task. The other thing that the really good leaders were able to do is have a relationship focus. And those that didn't start with a relationship focus actually built it over time and became more relationship oriented. So back to the, um, the little a bunch of elements that I promised you that I would talk through. We talked through some of them. But I wanna end, um, I think this is my last sort of content slide. So team composition, bios, and management. So I did the same thing like I did earlier on with three examples of things that I've actually heard either in the context of reviews or evaluations of teams or team science. So example number one, my postdoc and I are the initial members. Once funded, we'll identify additional team members. I've worked in teams before, so this is on management and plan planning. I've worked on teams before, so I know what to do and how to manage the team. The example two is, here's the team, right? And so we're, we're thinking about how do we, be, how do we um, include diverse perspectives, right? So there's a chemical engineer, two environmental engineers, and two material science engineers. So I think we heard in the course of today that really just having all engineers on the team probably doesn't really make it convergent, it doesn't really go beyond into other disciplines that could be and should be included in the context of the team. Um, the example of how the team would be managed is each of the PIs will head a team, the teams will work toward an aspect of the shared goal, the PIs will meet once a month to talk and compare notes. So the third example is there's a biomedical scientist, a physicist, an economist, an agricultural engineer, president of the Organic Farmers Association, and near and dear to my heart, I will admit it, is the organizational team consultant. Um, and so the description is, we worked over the last year to develop our vision for this project. Moving forward, here's the plan for how we will communicate, share data results, resolve conflicts, set expectations, bring on new team members, and engage the community. 
So the reason that I, talk, I, I said that the organizational team consulted is sort of near and dear to my heart, and I think it goes a lot to what John was saying earlier about the, some of the roles of the boundary spanders, is that it can be a real coup for you and your projects to bring in somebody who really understands how teams function. You can find these people, maybe they are some of the um, research pro um, professional, research development professionals in your organization. Maybe they're in the psych department, maybe they're in the so um, social department. You might be able to find people who have a real good sense. They might be in the business school. But having somebody who you can go to and say, we're storming, we need somebody to help us work this through, um, different dimensions of how to function as a team could be really, really beneficial. So my last slide, this is a picture of the field guide. You can find it um, if you Google team science um, at NIH or, um, or put in this URL, it will redirect you somewhere else, but it'll get you to the field guide um, landing page. I'm indebted to Howard Gadlin, Christoph Marchand, and Samantha Levine Finley, who have been working on the field guide for a number of years. This is the second iteration. My email is there. You're welcome to contact me. So I want to thank you for um, your attention. A lot of what I talked about is in the field guide, and of course I'm happy to, to chat with you. Um, my, next, my next responsibility, though, is to tee up the activity that you're doing next. And I think we're, did you get all get handouts? Did people, yeah, while I was talking? So um, what we're going to do now is we're going to head into a, an exercise where we're gonna give you about 20, 25 minutes to, to talk. And what we would like, oh, I have to change the slide. There we go. Michelle, Here. can I make one? Oh, please, yep. Yeah. Something went haywire with the handout in terms of the ordering of the questions. They do have a certain logic to them. So what Michelle just put up is the most useful ordering. I just wanted to know. <laughs> you can, okay, okay. So, um, so what we would like you to do for the next 20 to 25 minutes, we'll see how you're doing, is to talk about these four areas. We want you to talk about your mission statement, what is the mission of your project, what is, and, and I wanna uh, make sure you understand this is not for sharing, you don't have to, you know, it's not gonna be sharing with the whole group, but just to get you, have you give you a chance to kind of talk through your, um, your elevator ride speech. What is the focus of what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're doing it? Want you to talk about its linkage to social innovation or value. Want you to talk about disciplinary or sector categories of team composition and multi-level stakeholders. And want you to talk about me mechanisms to facilitate effective transdisciplinarity. And so you guys all have this like super awesome um, work uh, agenda and workbook. So if you look on page um, eight, you'll start to see that there's this area called supplementary materials, team formation and interdisciplinary teamwork. You've got overview and practical steps to consider. So you've got several, several pages of this. And so if you feel like you're, you don't quite know what you should be talking about, or you want some additional prompts and things to think about, there's a lot of great content here that you can use as a foundation. Okay, so about 25 minutes, we'll check in with you. Thank you. Um, so really do hate to cut that off um, because that's what it's all about, but we did want to kind of collectively First of all, we have Michelle here uh, um, to, who can maybe answer any uh, questions that arose from her talk, but then we'd love for you just to reflect on what was just happening. What was easy about it? What was hard? What was frustrating? What was exciting? Um, are you actually just talking amongst your team or did you reach out to um, other kinds of people? So is anyone willing to just offer a quick reflection on this exercise you just went through, or if anyone has a question for Michelle. Anyone? All right. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. 
I'm, I'm, I wasn't necessarily ready to offer a reflection, but I wanted to congratulate you on a really interesting talk. Oh, and uh, so I'm just going to kind of start maybe from very, very low down. Um, so readjust your expectations. Uh, um, I'd really, really appreciate, given the clarity of your talk, if you could just define interdisciplinary science, <laughs> transformational science, and convergent science, because I don't think I'm stupid, but I still feel really confused about the distinctions that people are drawing between these terms. <laughs> um, so are you familiar with systems biology? So there's, I don't know if it's a joke, but people say if you ask 100 people to define systems biology, you're going to get 100 different answers. And so I think that's very much sort of what this arena is. So for me, it's, it's difficult to really identify a difference between transdisciplinary and convergent. I think they're very similar. Um, you know, I think the easiest way to think about it is there's a continuum, right? So there's a continuum from unidisciplinary. I'm focused on my own problem in my own lab. It's very, very focused. And then you can start moving to something that we might call multidisciplinary, where you've got an expertise. I have one. We have a set of samples. You can do one thing with the samples, I can do something else. I don't fully understand what you do, you don't fully understand what I do, but we both have results. We can bring them together, we can write a paper. Okay, so multidisciplinary. Interdisciplinary, we're climbing the ladder now, where it's more integrative, where we're actually on the cusp of maybe disciplines and we're starting to learn a little bit about each other's worlds and languages. We're starting to pull things together a little bit more. We might even have somebody from a, you know, a very different discipline join us so that the complexity is increasing, the dimensions of what we're doing is changing. Having those different perspectives is changing how we're thinking about the problem. Does that make sense? So it's almost like we're, we're creating a new discipline almost. You know, we're doing it differently. Um, it's not just separating the samples and going away and coming back, but we're actually problem solving together. Okay, and then you get to transdisciplinary, and this is where it gets even more complex, because by now you're starting to involve social aspects, legal aspects, um, societal aspects. What's the community need? What are their challenges? Um, you think about like hurricanes and recovery, and what about the poverty and the people who have and have not? Does, so you're, you're, that's what you're doing, going across along this continuum. Does that help? It feels like it's very much rooted in. Oh, okay. sorry. It feels like it's very much rooted in the educational structure that we have and how we define the boundaries to start with. And so it, it just it feels like if we just had the boundaries in different places. I, I mean, I'm just trying. I'm trying to understand if there's a real distinction or if it's about boundary drawing. You know what? Like drawing maps. I I think it's very hard to draw lines between them. I think it's very difficult to say this is this, this is this, this is this. It's really a very, it's really a continuum. And as I said, when, when, so I was just at a conference um, this last weekend where the same topic came up. You know, everybody was like, what's the difference between convergence and transdisciplinary? And, you know, the same problem that we're having here. And so I think I would almost invite people to not get too bogged down in trying to make sure they have the correct definition because the next conference you go to, a group of people are probably going to define it somewhat differently. And so maybe if we can just accept the fact that we go from unidisciplinary all the way to transdisciplinary to convergent um, and just that the complexity of everything, the levels being evaluated is all continuing to increase from molecules to man to society? I would, I would say that the most important distinction is going from interdisciplinary or multi to either convergence or trans. And, and a good example is I had a project 20 years ago, and this was very typical of that time where I worked with an economist focused on land use change, a geomorphologist ch uh, focused on how streams all were altered by geomorphic processes, a hydrologist who looked at water flow, and then my group looked at biodiversity. We conceived of the project together, 
But then the economists ran the land use change projections, which were fed into a model that informed the geomorphic change in the channel, which linked to the hydrology, which informed the ecology. But we didn't create anything that was sort of brand new, that was emergent from all that. And we also didn't really focus on it as a social problem. It was a purely academic one. So I think that's where, to me, the distinction is really, really important. OK. Um, back to you guys. So who, this, this process that you just went through of reflection is really, really valuable and really, really important. And so as you form your centers and you really start thinking about how you're going to do your work, I would really encourage you to have a retreat at least once a year, if not a couple of times a year, but to take some time to reflect on how things are working. Are they working, not working, et cetera? So I would really love to hear from a table or two, maybe three. Um, what was this like to talk about the mission, um, to talk about these other things that are listed, how, how you're linking to social innovation value? How are you thinking of that? What was it like to talk about it? Is it all clear in your minds? So I, for us, mission statement, especially at this point, seems very premature. And the mission statement sh should come out of the needs and the goals of the team. So you could have some idea of what technology you want to build or some needs that are out there. And then as you build your team and you really nail down those needs and you develop what technological barriers there are, then the vision and the mission statement evolve out of that. It seems if you start with a mission statement, then you're sort of forcing everything to fit under that, and that could be problematic. And mine is, again, a question, too. It's just the difference, or, or how to differentiate between a goal or a vision statement with objectives and a mission statement. and. and how should it look like? Because you look at, we looked at, we cheated, we looked at different agencies, and, and they look totally different. Um, so different, different groups can take, kind of, take different approaches to what they call vision and mission and then the goals. My understanding of how it works is your vision statement is really your statement for the future. It's what, what, your, what the future will look like when you've accomplished your goal. The mission is really your statement about you know, what you are going to be doing at, in order to finally get to that mission, right? So how, or to the vision. How different is that from the objectives put together in centers to be the statement? Well, so your, your, well, your goals are the things that you're going to do that align with your mission. So you have an overall mission statement, and then you have a certain number of goals underneath that mission. And then you might have objectives for each of those goals. Does that make sense? OK. Hi. Uh, our center is looking at embedded security uh, with a bunch of social applications in medical and, and autonomous systems. And we're computer people in general. We, we go from hardware to software to networking. And, and actually, that, that whole area is built on these very vertical layers. And, and part of being a good engineer in these fields is, is, in fact, making a very good, clean boundary between one and the next. So I think part of our challenge is going to be uh, redefining those, we call them abstractions, or, or the modularity between the different layers. So I, I, I'm not quite sure how we're going to do it, but we may have to uh, break some of the existing, existing models that are typically between these layers. OK, thanks. Um, I think one of the questions we had as part of our discussion here is, you know, for like exactly the, the last question is what mechanisms or strategies in place to overcome barriers? 
I think you know if we can probably do some research, do some literature research, and probably follow the the book on how to do it. But ultimately, what matters is execution, right? And how many of us have actually done all of these activities? And so, how do you differentiate ourselves? And how do you even measure what we are doing? Is it actually correct or not? Like, I can do step one, step two. We can do the norming, storming process, or storming, norming process, and keep doing it. But ultimately, unless we do it. You know, there is no way to, to sort of correct ourselves as we go along. And so um, one of the challenges is how do I correct ourselves as we go along, if assuming we did get the grant uh, eventually. So. so I think that's, um, so that's really wise of you to say. And I think, as you said, you're not going to know what you're doing until you really start doing it. I think the other thing is, is I think you'll be surprised at how much you already kind of know, at least know theoretically, how much the, the members of the team will know. And if, you're, if you can figure out a way to make sure everybody can speak up, you can you know, communicate openly and honestly, and people can catch each other, I think you'll find that you do really well. Yeah. Who else would like to share? Just, just a, a quick response to, to that question. And, you know, there are lots of different ways to think about teamwork and, and organizational development, not, not the least of which is sort of the built-in learning methods to reflect, to, to do double loop, loop learning, to begin to build that in. And the other piece of the puzzle is there are lots of different ways, sort of non-traditional maybe ways of, of thinking about evaluation. We tend to think of summative evaluation as we're going we're gonna to drive a process, we're going to figure out what happens at the end, and we're going to declare victory. We did really well, or we failed. And, and some of the newer thinking about formative evaluation or even developmental evaluation, where you build evaluation steps in, and you think about what's our theory of change? Was it logical? Does the logic model work? Are there ways then to say at certain step points, not, not four or five years in, but months to years in? And, and I think that's a culture that organizations need to adopt. Is to, um, there's a great book on developmental evaluation um, and also lots of, lots of really good things on program theory that can help you sort of build in these ways and mechanisms to evaluate what you're doing in real time. So would somebody like, ooh, sorry, would somebody like to talk about the linkage to social innovation or value? What were your discussions like in that arena? Not everybody at once. Ah, right behind me. Peter Adrian's here, University of Michigan. Um, we, we're developing a center on smart infrastructure finance, so it's sort of the connection between engineering and, 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 and business and, and big data policy. Uh, in, in the conversation here on the social connection, uh, I was talking to Kurt, even though we've been talking about this for about a year, um, uh, about how, I guess, or where the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the social implications and applications could be. And with his background in um, dealing with uh, cities and with companies, I guess, that are, de are deploying some of these financing mechanisms. There were some new edges that came out and a couple of thank yous. <laughs> no buts or howevers. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that allowed us, I think, to, uh, to sort of rethink uh, the boundaries around the project. So uh, maybe two questions. One, in terms of the social science. Um, we we're unclear whether the expectation would be that we um, include social scientists uh, who would use established methods, or there would be social scientists who would be uh, developing research you know, agendas as part of uh, how we work together, studying us as a team and, and developing new uh, approaches. And then if I could just ask the second question in terms of social impact, we uh, wondered what the, maybe you don't know the answer, what the appetite of NSF and the reviewers would be for things that have global social impact uh, and perhaps less specifically within the U.S. and, and broader. Okay, so I'm hoping the program directors wrote those questions down because they're a little bit beyond my scope. Oh, so for yeah, both of them? I'm from the NIH, okay. so. Okay. <laughs> so can we have the program director help us out? 
I think the um, program directors, I think they're on at five oh, to five. do a session with you. So you just okay. have to wait a couple more minutes. All right, great. I was just Thank curious you. if there's anybody else who would like to talk, or give us a sense of with regard to the linkage to the social innovation or value. All right, so, so our uh, ERC is focused on wireless power transfer. Um, so, so I think all of us uh, are, are looking for cords all the time when we want to plug in our devices. And our goal is to basically remove all these cords for powering things in your home, in, in hospitals, and your cars, and stuff like this. And I think uh, from from social point of view, I think this is very critical because uh, our our life is is dependent on electrical power, and and the way we draw this power controls things inside the home and 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 things outside the home, and so we are we are now reaching uh, out to our social science folks in order to work with them on behavioral science and and see how people will be in this new society when they don't have to worry about the cords and power, uh, how will it basically affect their lifetime and basically open a lot of opportunities for them to engage in, in different ways in which they don't now. Um, so so that's, that's, the, uh, that's the theme of our ERC, to merge uh, people behavior uh, with respect to this, this technological advancement. Uh, 